Hello, everybody, uh, and thanks very much for joining us this evening for our Young Sports Photographers webinar. For those of you that don't know me, I'm James, and I work with the, uh, the Sports Journalists Association, uh, and I organise the SJ British Sports Journalism Awards. Uh, we've got what we hope is going to be a, a really informative webinar for everybody. Uh, just to give you a little idea of, uh, of what to expect, I'm really quickly just going to give you a run through uh, of what this Sports Journalist Association is, for those of you that may not know, uh, and sort of a little bit of talk about the SJ British Sports Journalism Awards, in particular the Young Sports Photographers uh, category, uh, which is going to be one of the focuses of the webinar. Uh, we then have Jackie Moores, Press Segment Manager at Canon, who's going to be interviewing two of last year's uh, SJ Photography Award winners, Harry Murphy from Sports File, who's last year's Young Sports Photographer of the Year, and Clive Mason from Getty Images, uh, two-time Sports Photographer of the Year, uh, who, uh, who uh, won a, won a, a hat-trick of SJ Awards, uh, SJA Awards last year uh, with a pretty special set of pictures. Uh, which we'll be looking at a little bit more later. I uh, just want to say a big thank you uh, uh, to these guys for giving up their time, uh, and especially to uh, to Canon, who sponsor the SGA uh, British Sports Awards uh, and help, to, uh, help us to make it all happen. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we have two copies of 2.8 magazine to give away. Uh, 2.8 magazine is the uh, the magazine for sports photographers by sports photographers. Uh, so please stay until the end, uh, and we're going to be picking two winners at random uh, for that. Um, just a reminder that if anybody has any questions at any point uh, throughout the webinar, then please put them in the chat box, uh, and we can either answer them as we go, or uh, we can pull them up for, uh, for for Harry and Clive when they come on a little bit later. Uh, right, so uh, let's get started with what is the SJA. Uh, the SJA is the, uh, the Sports Journal Associ Association uh, that represents sports journalists in the UK. Uh, an association with uh, just over 800 members from all areas of the sports media, sports writing, broadcast and uh, photography and editing. Um, the SJA, what do they do? They sit on uh, various accreditation panels, uh, act as an advisory body for media facilities, um, as well as giving all of their members uh, a hub to network, connect with each other uh, uh, and most importantly, the SGA, I think, is a voice for the industry. Uh, so whether you're a member or not, if you work in the sports journalism industry in the UK, uh, and if you have any queries, problems or concerns, then the SGA want to hear them. Uh, and we always try their best to help advise, amplify uh, your voice uh, and things like that. There are three levels of uh, membership for uh, people in various stages of their career. We've got full membership is for full-time professional sports journalists, whether, uh, whether writers, broadcasters or, uh, or, or photographers. Um, and with full membership, uh, people receive uh, an SJ press card, access to the international press card, which is the AIPS card. Um, and there's, there's also opportunity to, to network through the online membership system. Um, and uh, to gain access to SJ events. You've got associate membership, which is available to those that work in related work, like uh, like PR, P, PR or press officers. Um, and recently, the SJ have launched Academy membership. Uh, this is designed for anyone interested um, uh, in, in, in getting into the industry or people that are the very uh, start of their sports journalism career that maybe aren't sort of full time or just looking to make that breakthrough. Um, Academy membership is well worth joining. Uh, it's only just launched, so things are improving all the time. But the idea is that we'll be doing some more webinars like this uh, and hopefully eventually uh, uh, some in-person uh, events and things like that as well. Uh, and best of all, it's, uh, it, it's, it's free to join. So if you're, if you're not a member, it's uh, worth getting on to that. Uh, and you can join. Uh, you can join and find out sort of more information on sort of entry requirements and uh, uh, membership criteria and the benefits on the uh, on the SJA website. Um, another thing that the SJA uh, that does and what we're here to talk about today is the SJA British Sports Journalism Awards. Uh, the SJA Awards. Uh, 
uh, are essentially the Oscars of the uh, of the sports journal- journalism industry in the UK. Uh, they celebrate excellence across written broadcasts and photographic media. There are eight sports photography categories amongst the awards. All the details and entry requirements are on the uh, on the uh, awards website, which is slightly different to the SJA website, but you can access both through each other. Uh, and I'll be posting both of these URLs in the in the comments section as well. Uh, and today we're going to be focusing on the Young Sports Photographer um, uh, Award, which is now in its fourth year. Uh, the category is open to uh, photographers 25 and under, uh, but previous winners are not, el- uh, not eligible to enter. So sorry about that, Harry. Uh, but entries uh, must consist of five photographs representing a range of photographic disciplines. Portfolios can consist of photographs from just one sport or for multiple sports. So if you're a, a sports specialist or you only uh, you only uh, uh, pho- photograph football, for example, then you can uh, you can enter you can still enter your portfolio. That's a bit of a change from uh, from the competition rules last year. Uh, the entry deadline is next Wednesday, so we're running out of time. Uh, and again, everything is done through the, through the website. You can check out the URL. Um, uh, there's uh, all the information on rules, uh, the category descriptions, and how to enter is there. Um, but one of the questions is 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 why enter? What what what's in it really? Uh, obviously, uh, understand that the aim of any competition is going to be to win uh, or to be shortlisted, uh, and that is uh, that is a great reason to enter. This J Awards a recon- a recognisable achievement uh, to anybody in the industry, but. Beyond that, entering is just a really a great opportunity to get your work seen by the judges, uh, who are some of the best and most experienced figures in the business. Uh, I sit in the judging panel every year, not as a judge, but just overseeing. Uh, and every year, um, the judges have commented on the quality of the entries uh, and the fact that there's a mass of young talent in the industry. Uh, we publish, publish and, uh, and promote every portfolio that's entered through, uh, entered in the category, not just those shortlisted and, 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 and win. Um, uh, uh, again, these, these are promoted through the, through the SJA website and the SJA social channels. Um, every year, Canon have invited a range of entrants uh, to, to come to the awards event um, and see what it's all about and, and, and network as well. Um, and uh, we sort of, we feature uh, we feature the the uh, photographs in the Young Sports Photographers Gallery, um, and and just generally just to showcase your work. Um, but before I hand over to Jackie, I just want to show uh, you guys a video from last year uh, that we uh, we filmed with the judges, just explaining what they look for in uh, in a winning portfolio, a winning pictures. Yeah, me. What makes a good picture? Impact. Impact. It must stop and make me look at the picture. Impact, impact, and then a bit more impact. It must be well composed. It must capture the moment perfectly. It must be technically correct. Use the basics and then capture the peak of the action. You need some form of perspective in the picture, if you can do, to lead the eye into the picture. The, the most important thing is it's I want the picture to tell me something. Encapsulate all of that information within that fraction, that tiny fraction of a second. For, for a portfolio winner, you've got to show variety. And you must show the fact that you are a good action photographer, a good feature photographer, a good portrait photographer. And this that's what makes a set of pictures that would win Sports Photographer of the Year. You have to make it different. You have to make it impactful and you have to make it technically brilliant. Tens and hundreds of thousands of hours. That's the dedication it takes to be a great sports photographer. Uh, right, that's enough for me. Um, if anyone has any questions, then as I said, just uh, just put them up in the chat. I can see there's up in uh, there's some up there in the minute, which I'll get back to. Um, and I'm, now I'm going to hand over to uh, to Jackie Moores from Canon, who's going to speak to uh, to Harry first, and then uh, and then to Clive. Uh, over to you, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. So first of all, we're going to talk to the current Young Sports Photographer of the Year, 
Harry Murphy. So Harry is hailing from Hamel Hampstead. He's been a staff photographer at Dublin's international agency Sports File for three years, covering a variety of national and international sports. So let's just have a look at his career so far. Harry, great to have you with us. Let's start at the beginning. How did you get into photography? Um, playing football, I think. I always wanted to be a footballer as a kid, but I was, I was never good enough. Um, so I decided, well, I kind of still want to do this anyway. And then I, it was about year nine, year 10, when I had to pick what I wanted to do. And so there was a creative and media course, and I was kind of always into that, but I never really knew which kind of way I wanted to go. And the creative and media course really appealed to me because I mean, I didn't have to do a language as well, which was a big bonus. So I went and did that and it kind of, there was a lot of opportunities to do different things, drama, acting, performance, video, photography. And then I just decided to combine the photography with the football, go down to Hemel Hempstead Football Club with the camera and see what what it was. And from there, really, I was, I was kind of hooked. It was, yeah, it was brilliant. Fantastic. And so what sort of age did you get serious and how did you make your start? Um, serious is probably about 16 when I went to college to study just photography because then I knew then it was funny because sports the thing that kind of got me into it but then I was once I got exposed to other kinds of photography like fashion I didn't really I wasn't made my, I hadn't made my mind up whether or not it was just sports and football for me or if it was going to do other things and that's why college was so good because you didn't just have to do one thing it was a really technical course so they kind of there was a lot of studio work and you could really do what you wanted really within the parameters and and pick and pick something and then they had a work experience so in your second year of college you had to do a, some work experience and my college tutor happened to know Matt Lewis who works with Getty a lot and so he got chatting and said can Harry come with you to a game he does does a bit of sport and I've been going to Hemel a bit but not not loads but I kind of thought yeah this is this is fun and then so I went to him with him to Leicester v Bolton I got the train up and met him there and we went for a coffee before and had a chat and went down to the game and it was 5-3 I think it ended so it was a good first one to have and it was like the buzz was just unbelievable like I'd been going to football for sorry did you get a lot of those goals <laughs> uh, a couple one was a penalty I, I know I definitely got that Brilliant. <laughs> um but I'd been going to football since I was a kid like it was a season ticket holder at QPR for years but there was just something different about being that bit closer to the pitch and the noise experiencing the noise when you're not part of it and yeah like I just I remember being on the train back that day and just thinking like that's that's for me that that was unbelievable and then from then I just kept in contact with Matt I was getting more keen to get out I was going to Hemel more I was emailing our local um, newspaper the Hemel Gazette who weren't really that keen on me coming down they were they just weren't really interested but I just kept going and kept trying and then Hemel Hempstead got into the playoff final and they wouldn't give me accreditation. The club wouldn't give me accreditation. So I just went down early, brought a camera in and stood in by the goal. It was a terrace and the terrace was kind of below the pitch. It was a really nice angle. And um, and then the Hemel Gazette did take those pictures. And that was the first time I got published. And that, yeah, it was it was brilliant. That was kind of where it began. And, and then sort of sort of what happened still while you were at uni, um, where did you go from being at Hem Hemel? What, what matches came along after that? So then after college, I then went to Portsmouth University. And with university wasn't really that pra as practical as college. You couldn't, you had to kind of stick to the assignments and the projects that were given to you. You couldn't really manipulate them in the way I would have wanted. <laughs> So I kind of had to focus a bit more on what I was assigned to do. But the, the sports photography was always there. But I was just kind of right. I'll just focus on this and see like the fashion and stuff, see if I wanted to kind of go down other routes. But I was always chatting to Matt, always emailing him. And then I finally said to him, well, you know, do you think I kind of 
can I do something here? Can I come and work for Getty or do something like that? And then he put me in contact with Martin Willits, who, yeah, let me go down to a few Portsmouth games and kind of begun from there. So I saved up when I was in college, I saved up for my first camera by doing kind of Saturday jobs. And then it's kind of the gear did kind of hold me back a bit. Like you, you yeah. really need that equipment quite early on. You have to invest big. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but that was the good thing about university is they had equipment in abundance and you could just take it, go out, bring it back and it was brilliant whilst saving for your own gear like you couldn't you couldn't yeah. take the mic you couldn't take two or three bodies out but i had i had one of my own that was okay and their one was a lot better and it kind of worked it from there really so yeah i was going to portsmouth most weeks kind of get a bit further uh you know, the other weeks i was doing i still had a saturday job so i was working in a coffee shop so i would cycle down to the coffee shop for a 8 8 a.m do a shift till one cycle to fratton park do the game and then and then head home and it was yeah it was brilliant and then as university went on i was kind of ramping up with getty and then i said to martin you know i'd like to do a bit more what can i do and he put me in touch with mark trowbridge lighto as people call him uh to go in and edit and then i i kind of just sat in on a couple of editing things and then and they said yeah come in and do a few shifts so i was getting the train up from london to london sorry do a few shifts for him and then shooting a bit more and kind of trying to build it up there just trying to get I suppose a name for myself and just keep busy for when I did finally finish university I'd have something to something to do to try and stay in the industry so what happened when you did finally finish uni it's terrifying to be honest um so when I finished I was still I was freelancing I was keeping in contact with Martin and and Lito and then a former alumni of Portsmouth worked for the Daily Mail on the picture desk. Yeah. So I dropped him a message and see if he had anything and he did. So I went and worked on the picture desk of the Daily Mail on the and sports. Was oh, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. It, from going from doing the photography to the editing and then working for them, it was you just cause you just saw I was looking at 70, 80,000 pictures a day. And watching the matches and seeing how the pitches came in live who was first what was coming in and it was it was just brilliant it wasn't it was interesting to see as well the editors what they were looking for so they weren't yeah. always they if if a picture was in first it had to be used on the site they didn't care whether it was the best picture they didn't want me to wait for another picture you just get that picture on the site now and that so that was really fair. fascinating to see did that feel quite different after like learning to shoot the best pictures suddenly realizing that there's a point where actually it doesn't matter it's got to be first yeah definitely well it was interesting seeing the difference between the online and the paper so the paper could wait there was a lot less of a rush for them but the the, the online's just didn't the, the quality didn't matter they just had to have that picture and so yeah it was i learned so much in that in that period between doing the three was yeah. just brilliant i just learned so much and yeah i'd recommend that massively for any of those any of those you did a bit brilliant. of editing at getty as well didn't you um, a bit of what sorry you did a bit of picture editing at getty as well didn't you so yeah seeing those pictures come in obviously that must have been quite quite interesting yeah working yeah so you, you'd either work as part of a team so they'd someone would be cropping someone captioning someone photoshopping yeah. but then other times i would have gone out on site so i went out with alex morton a couple of times for a hockey tournament and then so sort of sitting beside him and he was saying no like do this don't do that kind of and that was that was brilliant seeing how different people every photographer is different everyone wants their pictures edited in a different way and different styles and yeah just trying to take in as much information as i could really just trying to talk to everyone and listen to everyone and still keep in contact so every contact i made i kind of just kept chatting to kept sending them pictures like i'd email until i came to dublin i was still emailing matt constantly annoying him asking <laughs> him what he thought of this what he thought of that given he would send me back like cropping instructions like oh you did this i would have done that oh, and brilliant. just just annoying well not annoying people but just constantly 
asking people things and what they would have done. And then through the Daily Mail, then I was like, you wouldn't really see any of the photographers when you're working on the picture desks, just never come in. But then I kind of got chatting and said, well, can I chat to them? And so I spoke to Andy Hooper and Kevin Quigley and then was trying to get in there. And I did a few, I did a couple of shifts for them and I went along to a couple of games with Andy Hooper and then annoying them, keep chatting to them, keep asking them things. And yeah, just trying to get as much information as I could, just try and learn, basically. Brilliant. I think um, everyone here would really like to know how you landed a job as a staff photographer at one of the top international sports agencies. How did that come about? Um, I saw it posted on Twitter, actually. Richard Heathcote retweeted it. And um, and I thought, God, move move abroad to do this. And so, I, like, I didn't – I just applied for it. I thought, yeah, like – I can worry about whether I actually want to do this or not later. Just apply and see what happens. And then I got a phone call interview. And then my boss now, Ray, said, we'll come to Dublin and we'll have a chat. And then I thought, right, OK, this, I have to actually think about this now. Do I do I want to move to Ireland? Like, it's a massive. Moving to university is one thing. It's an hour and a half down the road by train or car. To, to move, like, to fly abroad was, yeah, it was terrifying. But I kind of thought, well... Do you know, all these years I've wanted to be a sports photographer and I was kind of, I was doing okay with the three jobs, but I was turning down jobs shooting for Getty to do picture desk at the mail. And they were just, I was thinking, well, I, I just want to take pictures. Like I think the best way I'm going to learn and develop is by taking pictures. So I, yeah, so I flew over to, to Dublin to meet Ray, Brendan and Ramsey. They were waiting for me at the airport. We had a coffee and a chat. I had a little portfolio on an iPad and flipped through it. And then um, and they said, go off and go have a look around the airport. So I just, <laughs> so I just went to a spa and was just flicking through magazines or something and came back. And then Ray said, do you want a job? Wow. And uh, And so I flew home with a job had to move and just yeah it was terrifying to be honest uh but I just and how's that I just been? Want, oh, it's brilliant I love it absolutely love it just it's challenging in that there's new sports over here and it's a really they speak the same language but the culture is so, it's so different everything's just not similar but not quite the same and you kind of yeah, but the, in terms of the photography, it, it's brilliant. I learned so much. Like you just the Gaelic games are just so quick. Like hurling, you'd look down at your laptop and the ball would be up the other end, and you look up and it's in the goal, and it's just like lightning. And they move it so quick, and it's aggressive, and and yeah, the grounds aren't some. Most of the grounds aren't the prettiest, and the lights aren't great. But you kind of just have to adapt, and yeah, it's. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. So this was the third time you entered the SJA Young Sports Photographer category and definitely third time lucky for you. Let's um, take a look at this winning portfolio. I think at the beginning, if you could tell me a bit about the selection of the final images and how, first of all, before we go into the images, just tell me a bit about how you thought about putting these five images together, what you did to get to this point? Well, I think one of the main things was I wanted variety. So at the beginning of the year, I sat down and kind of thought I had a chat with a few of the lads here and was constantly reviewing stuff and seeing what I could have done. And and I thought, well, I need I need a lot of variety and not just in not just in the kind of types of photos I'm taking but the events that I'm going to and and so I kind of set out right I can do do a bit of horse racing do some boxing um rugby football I didn't I kind of wanted to stay away from the Gaelic games because it's the British awards so I wanted it to be I don't know I suppose a bit more relatable to maybe to the judges so they know what they're looking at and um and obviously then the pandemic happened and had to adapt some of the pictures are a bit a bit quirkier like the training at home kind of thought you know you need a bit you need a bit of that in it for the year that's in it 
and uh and yeah just variety and then the colors as well i wanted like didn't want them all to be quite dark under floodlights I wanted a, a mixture of bright and just yeah just try and show what i can do really i think that's what you're trying to show the judges that you're you've got a lot of variety in your photography and you, you're not just a one-trick pony okay so let's take a look at the horse racing the return of horse racing on your image here yeah this is i had i had this in mind for a, a while this is the first day that horse racing was allowed back in ireland it was an industry it's considered an industry here so it's not really a sport as such so it kind of got go ahead before the rest of anything really but we weren't allowed accreditation they were only letting one or two photographers in and they're kind of just horse racing photographers which is fine so we kind of but had, had to cover the day really so I looked on Google Maps and there was a row of houses that were just were only for a couple of the starts. So I was kind of walking along. I had a few pictures for a fence and stuff, but it just wasn't really just wasn't really that shot. So we kind of I was just walking down the road and looking into houses and there was a trampoline and a couple. I thought I had the idea of like kids jumping on a trampoline with the horses going by in the back. And so I knocked on a few doors and like it was in the height of, it was in the height of the pandemic people weren't that keen on me coming into the houses but luckily this family well they weren't keen but I kind of mm. talked my way in and got into the garden and I could see the the horses going to post behind so I knew I didn't have much time and then so they didn't want me in the house they said in the garden only okay it's fine and then then I kind of thought wow I saw this structure and I saw like it was just brilliant with the sandbags on it and they were watching the races over it. I thought, oh. so I asked if I can go upstairs into the into their bedroom and take it. And yeah, they they weren't yeah. too convinced, but they they let me in the end. And yeah, it was yeah, it was brilliant. And but initially on the day, I cropped it as an upright. I I got rid of the mum on the left. I don't know if you how clear that is. The mum looking on the left, uh, just it just adds like a kind of mischievous look to it. But on the day, I didn't really see that as a picture and just tried to keep it clean. And um, it was, it, yeah, it was only, I got a lot of feedback for the, the portfolio. I was asking a lot of people, a lot of video calls. Um, and I remember watching this this webinar last year, Richard Heathcote said, you know, if anyone wants to get in contact. So I did. So I gave him a message and we had a Zoom and he, he loved the woman in the corner. He said, I don't know why you've, why you've cut this upright like it's it's so much better and it, yeah like now that i see it i don't know how i ever i did it so like so the moral to that is feedback's massive okay and then on to the hurdler molly molly scott yeah this was i saw on twitter she she posted a picture she was on a horse and jumping around and she was training as well and i thought that'd be a cool thing to kind of go down to. So I just, I just dropped her a message on Twitter and thought, <laughs> would you mind if I come and take pictures of you training? And she, yeah, no problem. And everyone, I think everyone was quite bored at this stage in the pandemic, there wasn't really anything to do. And in Ireland, there was a two kilometer limit on how far you could go unless it was for work. Yeah. And so I kind of convinced myself that this, yeah, this is work. This is, this is okay. So I drove, I think an hour and a half to her house and then, uh, and did did a few pictures I, I think i kind of this was taken i think it was for the awards like a, a kind of all these projects were always just to keep a bit of sanity really just to do yeah. try and keep the creative juices flowing during the pandemic and when nothing was on and and yeah i think it yeah i think it works well i think the socks are great <laughs> <laughs> um paul townen winning the gold cup yeah, so I added this into the folio because I just really like the colours, like the, the yellow against the blue. I think it really popped and as part of the set, it really stood out. And I didn't really have any strong celebrations. Like I had a few football ones, but I thought I needed some. I needed that in the folio. I needed something with a bit of character or animation. And so I added this and there was no point adding just some subpar celebration from a league of ireland football match because it's just never it would it just wouldn't stand up against english football so but i love the colors in this and like the raw emotion in them and 
Yeah. That's absolutely brilliant. And then you've got the boxing qualifier. Yeah, so this is, I think this was the last event I did before things closed down. So I was really just trying to get as much as possible because I thought, I don't know how long we're going to be closed down <laughs> for. It was the last, it was the last event in Europe to be taking place. It was, it was in London actually. And yeah, um, yeah the, the country had been locked down, but they were still fighting. And so I thought, I, I have to, I have to make the most of this. And, um, and yeah, I really liked the colours, like the, the kind of red against the blue and the the ripple on the cheek and the the yeah. ear it's just it's quite unusual for, especially for their weight category to kind of get that weird kind of yeah movement brilliant and then of course the jewelry read at the rugby which is <laughs> amazing yeah it was listening to last year's webinar again coming back to that uh R richard pelham said start start with a banger and it was constantly in my head start of a banger start right okay i'll start the folio like get get the judge's attention i think is what he was trying to say and this was taken the 18th of december so i had i was still kind of working out the portfolio but i wasn't really sure what what would be my first image or what would complete the set and then and then yeah this this happened and <laughs> it's one of those you can't really plan for it you can't say i'm going to get a rugby player that looks a bit like a viking and pour blood down half his face and have him look up into the light like yeah the light in his eyes is amazing yeah so it just it was it was perfect really it just really completed the set and yeah true i think it really as a first image like it really grabs the attention yeah definitely a banger i mean it, it's a fantastic set to have shot through um, a covid year as well i mean you've really got a lot a lot of great images there just um tell us how did you feel when you found out you were just shortlisted um i was really shocked to be honest jackie <laughs> uh yeah there's no real it, it it didn't i didn't get an email or a text or anything it just it just got put up the the link to the article saying oh shortlist okay. announced and i was scrolling through it and it's, it, it did i think young photographers was the last one so seeing all these names like really renowned photographers like for the shortlist was just amazing yeah. and then it came down to the young photographers and i saw and i saw <laughs> my name there and thought that's uh that, that, that's a bit odd that and uh i didn't even then when it was down to five i still didn't think i i would win it to be honest like some of the especially when i then saw the portfolios like just by looking at the other names that were shortlisted i thought yeah one of them is probably probably going to win it and i was i was delighted just to be shortlisted so i didn't i wasn't really fussed just to see my name on that list i would i'd have been happy with that but then yeah to win it was just brilliant fantastic fantastic and just on a last note what advice can you give to those starting out who want to kind of follow in your footsteps my, my footsteps <laughs> um just you just have to do it really just come out of your comfort zone and talk to people and just jump in you just don't know what what speaking to someone is going to lead to like I didn't know that asking my college tutor does he know anyone who might take me on for some work experience is going to lead me to Matt Lewis who works for Getty and and to start all this so you just you just don't know what conversation is going to lead to what so chatting to people is massive getting loads of feedback like I always I, even now I still speak to people and like one of my colleagues Brendan I would always chat to and he'd always put me in my place and I'd always think I know best but he he would tell me I don't and I'd probably agree with it now I don't I, as much as I like to think I know best I, I don't so yeah just lots of feedback and just doing it like things it's, it is scary like you, you're putting a lot of money into this you're putting a lot of time into this it is a risk but it's one of the best jobs in the world so it's worth it <laughs> worth it keep going that that is really great advice so thank you harry luckily as james mentioned earlier the rules do not allow harry to enter into the young photographers category this year so there's plenty of opportunity for all of you a big space to be filled so thank you very much harry and we are going to move on to clive Hi, Jackie. Hi, Clive. And you? Good, good. Um, 
Well, welcome. We have the legendary Clive Mason of Getty Images, the overall reigning sports photographer of the year, smashing through last year's award, and he won a hat trick of titles. So, Clive, as always, we're really keen to learn about what initially got you into photography. I mean, look, my, my story probably couldn't be much more different to Harry's if, if you tried. Obviously, Harry's much more of a of the, of, of the current generation, if you like. So his story is probably a little bit more relevant. I mean, my 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 photographic journey began at seven when when I photographed a giant tortoise on my father's Voigtlander, you know, range finder. And he showed me how to process and we made this little black and white print from it. And that, that's, um, as a side note, that tortoise is actually still alive. And that was shot when I was seven. It's 190 years old, I think, something like that. Very random, but from that moment on, that, that was when my my photographic kind of juices started flowing. And I thought, wow, that, that was pretty cool, but, you know, at the age of seven. And obviously, you know, I'm not going to tell you that was the start of a glittering career because it really wasn't. That was the point. I thought, well, that's a lot of fun. I like that. Um, and then and then kind of went on from there. Just my, my father sadly passed away not long after that. But I always had this buzz and this desire to take photographs. So, you know, um, I just did anything I could to to learn what I could, and uh, bizarrely at school, my physics teacher. I wasn't very I wasn't very academically um, well clever to be fair, but my physics teacher recognised I had this burning desire to to take photographs, and he he taught me quite a lot about photography in a very early in a very early stage really, because um, he was a mad keen photographer himself, and we used to go on these school trips and look at stuff, and I wouldn't be interested in the academic side and the learning side of it, and he recognised that, but he'd show me how to take a nice picture of it, which was quite sweet really when you look back at it, and then I'd you know I'd kind of go home and I'd do what everyone does, you put your roll of thirty six into you know I can't remember what it <laughs> there you go into boots whatever it was, um, and that's kind of where it you know where it started. Um, obviously at that point I didn't know I was going to be a professional. I didn't know I had no desire to photograph sport. I had no desire. I just didn't know, basically. I had no no idea what I wanted to be doing. Um, it's only later when you get given opportunities and you 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 try and you work out and you you, you meet people like Harry Wright, you said. It, it's all about meeting the right people, putting yourself out to meet the right people. You don't accidentally meet the right people. That doesn't happen. You you need to make a bit of an effort. Um and I, I made an effort. I got lucky. I had some very lucky breaks. But you, you've kind of just got to, you've got to put yourself in that position. And even now, when you're taking photographs, people say, "Well, that's a lucky shot." Well, it is maybe, but you've got to be there. And when it happens, if it's lucky and it happens in front of you, you still got to get it. There's an element of luck that it's happened in front of you, but you still got to, you still got to have the whereabouts to to actually to capture it. And if we go back, you went, you went to um, Buck's Camera Club when you were very young. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I started Buckingham, Buckingham Camera Club was somewhere I, I mean, look, we all know camera clubs can get a bit of a bad rap sometimes, sometimes, but I was told early on, if you want to learn to print a picture properly, you can do it at a camera club, you know, you can't get into newspapers to find out how to print, but you can get in and you can go to camera club and they'll show you how to do everything meticulously well, and, and I did, I, I joined this camera club and I learned how to print, at this point I was probably... 12 13 14 they made me drink coffee which i despise i'd have about six six sugars in my coffee every time they gave me a coffee but i caught with it and i was the youngest member there and you know you just got to meet people nothing nothing to do with the industry just really keen amateur photographers you you know and, and let's let's be honest we all start as amateurs let's not belittle what amateur photography is because it's a it's a joy and a passion for most people we we choose then to take it on further and make it something else and you probably a little bit of you, there's a little tiny bit of you that you leave behind when you're an amateur that you you you, you constantly pine for as a professional because it'd be lovely to just have that sort of buzz of, oh, it's, it's, I can do what I like here. But it becomes, it's a bit more of a challenge when it's professional, but it's a choice you make. And obviously, I don't regret one one second of it. So where did where did you go after that? When you're sort of like when I okay, so look, I I spent my my teens basically taking photographs of anything and everything that I could. Um, I left school. Um, I didn't study photography at all. Um, I knew what what I thought at the time. I thought I knew what I needed to know about taking pictures and about processing them. And all I needed to do was earn some money so I could buy some kit. 
And as Harry rightly said, you know, it is, it shouldn't all be about the kit. Now it's more about the kit than ever it was then. In the old days, you know, if you had any, any SLR that you could put a long lens on, you, you could kind of do the job. Now you're up against people with an enormous, you know, um, wealth and breadth of kit. Um, it's not all about the kit because it's all about you and what you see. But, but I basically went out and I got a job in a garage to be honest and i sold cars and i sold parts for cars um and very uninterestingly it wasn't something i aspired to do but it was something i thought i can do this i'm good at it i can earn some money and i did i earned some money i i sold cars by the day worked in the parts department did all these kind of rubbish jobs that i, I just felt i needed to, to to earn um and then i bought my basic camera kit um, from the money I'd earn but then like we were saying earlier like the you know the twists and turns and, and the luck that played into my hands was the um the deputy picture editor at the Chronicle Echo in Northampton where I was where I was living um was converting an old Triumph and he was coming in and he was buying parts and I got chatting to him and he over the course of the weeks and months and whatever he, he realized i was kind of into taking pictures and asked what he did and he said he was the deputy picture editor and and then exactly like harry said all you do then is you become like a bit of pest yeah. you just bother people you pester them you push you push you push and in the end he said oh christ what are you doing on saturday i said i'm doing nothing he said well come to the office i'll give you some films um and you can go out and take some pictures of whatever it was happening you know just just saturday league football on on Northampton's like race course or the Abington Park or whatever it was. So I went along, met him, and he he said, Go and grab some film. I went to the offices and he said, Go and grab some film. So I came out with, with one little roll of film and, and he went, and I said, get some films. I said, Well, how do you, how many can I have? He said, Well, just grab a box of 20, that's fine. And and it was I was like, Oh my God, that's more film than I've ever ever dreamed of in one go. Because every every roll of film you bought, you had to pay for. And then to process it, it cost you money. To print it, it cost you money again. So everything was, it was to, for this guy to suddenly say, right, okay, there's your film, there's a box of 20, off you go. And when you've shot it, come back in here, we'll process it in the dark room. So basically it was my first experience of going out, taking pictures that someone else has paid for the film and I was coming in and someone else was going to pay for all the chemistry and it was a proper dark room. The, the Northampton Chronicle Echo was a, was a fabulous, when I started there, it was a fabulous newspaper. It was a big black and white broadsheet. And it, it, they had some of the, you know, photographers there at the time have gone on, news photographers, feature photographers, portrait photographers have gone on to be, you know, some of the industry leaders. Mm. And I learned a lot from them. I learned about shooting portraits. I learned about light. I learned about processing the, the newspaper way as opposed to probably the camera club way, which was a bit more fastidious and a bit slower. So they taught me how to get it, to get what we needed, get it quickly, get it in the paper. And yes, it was a local paper. But to me, it was like, it, it was like, I died and gone to heaven. It was, yeah. it was just an amazing experience to be working in a in a in a proper full on tailor made dark room because my dark room experience had been in a in a you know in a timber makeshift dark room in the back of my garage. You know that that was all I knew, and it was damp and it was dusty, and all my legs were scratched. It was horrendous. Um, and then suddenly I'm in this amazing facility, um, and and it's all there. It was it, it was just amazing. Brilliant. And um, so while you were working on the paper, you were doing a lot of news stuff and then you started doing a bit of sport. How did that happen? OK, so what happened was I'd, I'd had an interest in sport photography, um, obviously, which is why the picture just sent me out and did this, you know, Saturday league football and whatever. Um, but then, of course, when I, he said to me, do you want to come and work for us? Ultimately, it was like, well, it wasn't a staff job. It was only you know, like a freelance. But if yeah. you're around at that, we can use you to do X, Y, Z. <clears throat> so I, I was turning up and he'd, he'd get me in. And if they were short of a guy on a Tuesday or whatever, so you'd go in and the, the classic local newspaper diary would be everything from golden weddings to, a, you know, a presentation at the local fire station to whatever. I mean, literally, it could have been anything. Um, and then, oh, God, Northampton Saints are at home tonight. Who wants to do that? Oh, God, 7.30. Well, who wants to do that? And I go, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do that. I'd really like to do that. And they're like, so suddenly, very quickly, they realised that, hang on, we've got a guy here who is interested in sport, wants to do just the sport. He wants to do the football, the rugby, the cricket, whatever else is going on. He's keen. And and the guys were like, brilliant, because it meant they didn't have to work evenings, weekends, you know. 
and it was it was kind of almost handed over to me in its entirety the, the sport i just did all the sport Brilliant. um and, and kind of unlike yet again unlike harry and unlike a lot of sports photographers i've said this before and i don't know if it actually counts against me sometimes but i'm not a, an avid sports fan what i am is a fan of photographing sport um like harry's harry's way into the industry was by um wanting to be a footballer realizing he was never going to be a professional footballer so the way to stay close to that is to, is to become a photographer and that's the story for for a large a large percentage of, of sports photographers my passion is the photography but i i love photographing sport and i don't really like photographing anything else but i i don't there are times when i think god i wish i really loved i really wish i loved this sport but i think sometimes being a little bit removed from it puts yeah. you in a position because you can look at it subjectively and not get caught up in the moment and just concentrate on what you're doing and not and not be overawed by the by the by, what's the, by the event or yeah by what's happening because you know we we go to some 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 big events and you witness some big moments and the last thing you want to do is be sitting there going oh my god i can't believe that's whoever it might be about to do whatever it's about to do yeah. just, here we go again you know and and i don't mean that at all to be blasé about it because yeah you know, I, I i you know i get nervous everyone gets we, we're all like oh my god i can't mm -hmm. and if you if you were if you had the added complication of being a huge fan of that particular sport right. or whatever yeah. then you'd be it, it could really weigh you down but you've got to make sure it doesn't weigh you down and if you are a sports fan you've got to work out a way of making sure that you can just remain professional and not let it all get too um yeah. too much for you really i think brilliant so then after working on the newspaper how did you manage to take the next steps that got you where you wanted to be very very similarly to how i got involved with with the local paper to be honest with you living in northampton there was a there was a, a sports photographic agency called bob thomas sports photography who um was a was an absolute pioneer um back in back in the in the 80s um 90s um, and he he kind of ran his business alongside all sport and for those who don't know all sport then became getty images who ultimately i'm i work for um but getty weren't around when i started in 1994 it was all sport that, that kind of employed me so all sport and bob thomas <clears throat> were the two places you wanted to work um but i was living in northampton of course bob thomas was based in northampton so i thought well i need to write this guy a letter i want to write to him i want to say that this is who i am i really want to get involved in in sports photography um so as soon as I did, I wrote to Bob, and then the next thing I know, I had a phone call from from a gentleman called Monty Fresco, who was a an old Daily Mirror legendary. I mean, you use the word legendary, Jackie. When I was so you know, the, honestly, Monty Fresco, for those who don't know, was was an absolute diamond geezer in in the truest sense yeah. of the word. He was he he was Fleet Street through and through. Um, he said, right, I want you to come in and show me your pictures. So we, we made an appointment. I went in and I took my folio with me. And it was a it was a, you know, obviously there's no iPad. It was a big 1216 flip folio. And he looked through it and he went, oh, bloody hell, he said, it's not very good, is it? And I'm like, and I thought for a minute he was joking. He went, I said, yeah, but you know, I said, I've, I know I've got a lot to learn, but I've got age on my side. He said, well, you haven't really. He said, you know, he said, what are you, 21 now? He said, you, you know, you need to be, you, you need to be ahead of this. I said, well, he said, I've got an 18 year old, Sean Bottrell, who's already going out. He's flying out to Vegas to photograph all the big fights and he's doing this, he's doing that, you know. And I'm like, right, okay. And and you can take this in from, you, you can take this advice one of two ways. You can go, oh my God, I've missed the boat. Yeah. I'm not good in. What am I going to do now? Or you can go, Right, you know what? I want a bit of that. Yeah. Right. So, what do I need to do? And he looked. He looked. He, you know, he wasn't. He wasn't nastily criticising my photo, but it was a time in the industry where you could just say it as it was. And I, we, we've lost that a little bit now. And I, I, probably for the right reasons. You know, I had some brutal criticism from various people. You know, picture editors ripping up pictures in front of you, um, throwing them in the bin, saying, "Get out!" You know, you do that again, you're out. You know, and and you were like okay and it did it did happen and i and i'm not saying that that is the right way but i'm saying it happened and i'm saying it's a very very steep learning curve and you you had to you, like i said you had two options you had to take it on the chin or you got out and chose something else and you know that i can count on probably on two hands the, the amount of proper knockbacks you got during the years and thought i don't know if i'm strong enough for this 
but you, you persevere and it was what you want. I knew it's what I wanted. Yeah. So I persevered. I thought, right, I'm not having you tell me that that's no good. And Monty wasn't like, and Monty was, I don't ever want to put him in that category because he's, he's not with us anymore. He, but he taught me a lot and he helped me. He said, right, come back in six months. Show me what you've done in six months. So I did. He looked at it. He went, that's better. That's more like, that's what we need. We don't need to see his legs. We know he's got legs. We want to see his face. We, and, it, and it was yeah. all... It was all very, very good, it's very simple advice, but you, you just need sometimes somebody to tell you exactly how it is rather than pussyfoot around it and, you know, cover it in candy. It, it, it's a bit like just don't don't let criticism put you off because it can do and it can be yeah. it can be harsh. And was it hard to go off and build that portfolio up on your own? Um yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't really got any guidance. I'd, you know, at, at that point, that I've slightly got this in the wrong order because that was kind of before I'd started really doing stuff with the Chronicle and Echo. But yeah. it was then the Chronicle and Echo and being surrounding yourself with people who were were really good. Like I said earlier, accomplished photographers who you'd yeah. sit in, the, you'd go into the office in the morning, the teamwork and the camaraderie. You go in, you'd look at the diary. Everyone would laugh at what they got, and someone said, "Oh, I've got that another eighty-year-old Danivers or you know what." diamond wedding or whatever it was um but i have to i have to point out that on the local paper there's there's a lot of rubbish to do but there was also an incredible amount of decent stuff that i did working for a local mm. paper they sent me they sent me up into the arctic circle on a cruise liner they sent me to northern ireland to do the troubles out there they sent me god knows everywhere i, I took a d-day veteran back to the beaches in normandy with his wife and had him walking yeah. on the beaches I, I, it was just really really character building and you learned a lot about dealing with people which i'll be honest with you i'm not the best person dealing with people i think that's why i like sports photography so much because you're on the end of a long lens and you generally don't have to have too much to do with your subject that obviously comes back to bite you in the ass a little bit when you end up getting sort of more of a, a commercial brief and you have to work with clients and you have to work with those athletes or, or whoever they may be so it, it really isn't something you can't choose it because you think, oh, well, you know, I can, I can get away with that because it's all long lens and whatever. It kind of, in, in practice, it really isn't like that at all. It, it's very much more people-led than you might think. And it is making contacts, keeping contacts, keeping people happy and and learning learning every single day, you know. Yeah. So how did the big break come to become a star photographer at Allsport and onto okay. your career well, the, the the big break there was yet again living in Northampton. You meet people, you know the people who are around you, um, and I got to meet a couple of Bob Thomas's photographers. I also knew another photographer who was um, based in Northampton, who had just been offered a job at All Sport, um, and he kind of provisionally accepted it, um, and they they were expecting him. Um, and frankly, he, he he then decided it wasn't for him. He didn't want the job. So I, at this time, knew people like I keep dropping the names, Sean Bottrell, mm. Clive Brunskill, um, Dave Rogers. I knew these people. I'd been out socially with them. You know, they knew what I was doing. They were looking at my stuff. And they'd always offer. I, I'd always, like Harry said, you're always showing people stuff. You're always showing, oh, I've done this. What do you reckon to that? What do you reckon to that? What do you reckon to that? And they'd, they'd say, well, you know, really, that needs to be an upright. Really needs to be tighter. It needs to be this. It, it, so it was all constructive. And you need that. You need that feedback and criticism. Um, as well as someone patting you on the back and going, wow, that's great. You know, it's not all about that. Um, so long story short, Clive Brunskill said to me, he said, you know what? That guy's turned the job down. I'm going to put your name in in front of, of Adrian Morrell, who was at the time um, the, the, the boss there, and, and Lee Martin. I said, well, I can't. I can't. I'm not his standard. I can't do what he does. He went, no, 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 but you'll learn. You'll learn. Anyway, so long story short, I get an interview and I go down and I see Adrian and Lee. Um, and it was pretty similar to Harry. Actually, they they sort of had a chat. I sat in there and showed them my stuff, and 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 I couldn't believe I was there. I couldn't believe that these two guys who I knew of were sitting there looking at my work. And they went, yeah, yeah, very nice, very nice. Right, okay, right. Go and sit in that room over there for a minute. Well, you only see you go out and you sit in the room over there. And they said, well, there's a coffee machine over there, so you're in a big office. You don't really know anybody. None of the guys I knew were there apart from Sean, who'd driven me down for the interview. And you um. I thought, and they called me back in and went, right, okay, when can you start? I said, um, what? And they said, well, we're going to give you a job. We're going to take you on. We're going to take a chance on you. I said, okay, wow, blimey. And they said, how much are you earning now? And I said, oh, um, 
I can't remember at the time. It was just, I think it was probably because I wasn't salaried. It was about £15,000 a year. I was earning something like that. They said, right, well, we're going to give you eight. We want you to move to London. You've got to buy your own car. And I'm like, okay. um, right. So that's that's tricky. Okay. And be like, Harry, you have to, you know, there's, there's a harsh moment of reality here. You think, right, am I going to take a chance on this and think I can make it work? Or am I going to run back to Northampton with my tail between my legs and stick to what I know? And I could probably get a very comfortable and nice career doing what I did. But I, I knew what I wanted. I said, yeah, let's do it. So to be fair, six months I did. Um, and then Adrian and, and Lee called me back into the office said, yeah, you made the cut. We're very happy with what you did. They they decided to, to to fund me properly, so to speak. They gave me the pay rise. Um, they gave me the car and and I never looked back. Um, it was it was difficult. It was hard and it was a steep, steep learning curve again. But it was the mm -hmm. sacrifice you made and the risk you took was, you know, you, you do sacrifice a lot when you become mm -hmm a photographer and a sports photographer you, you it is a way of life it needs understanding partners you need you know understanding children understanding everything that you miss a lot you miss birthdays you miss weddings you miss everything and it it, 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 it there's a fine balance but just it's a big sacrifice but it's worth every single minute and i've enjoyed my career massively so at all sport, you were covering a lot of different sports, a few international things to start with. How then did you come on to become the renowned sort of F1 photographer that you are? How did that next bit part come along? Okay, well, I I um, obviously turned up at, at, at all sport stroke Getty as, as a sort of an unknown. So they didn't really know what it so it sort of threw me into everything, really. Um, and I think I'd been there about eight months and, and Adrian called me into the office and he said, um, do you like cricket? I said, yeah, I don't, I don't mind cricket. I said, I don't know much about it, but I quite like cricket. He went, right. He said, um, you're, going, you're going off on a cricket tour with Sean, and you're going to basically, you're going to be editing for Sean. Um, and when he's when you're not editing his films, you can you can shoot some pictures. So I said, oh, that sounds like fun. Where's the tour? And he said, they said, the West Indies. And I'm like, oh, okay, blimey. And how long am I there for? And they said, well, uh, probably about eight weeks. And I'm like, right, okay. So having gone from, you know, eight months previous doing, you know, local local newspaper work to being told you're going to the caribbean for eight weeks with one of the world's leading sports photographers um i was like wow okay so what what that did for me was yeah my cricket knowledge was poor i, I had a, obviously i had an understanding of photography so while sean's sitting there doing the groundwork and doing all the proper work and photographing it was an australia tour of the west indies and he had he was very close to the australian team at the time so we were very very welcomed we got there and the, the team were all very welcoming and, and welcomed me like i was an old friend which was something you never ever forget, a very, very, very friendly bunch of people. Um, so while Sean's sitting there doing the hard work, I was able to flounce around with a with a sort of a 70 to 200 and a, and a camera with a roll of transparency in it. And, and we'd had this storm and they'd just come out, innings had resumed. It was a tour, the tour match in St. Kitts. And we got this, it was a really windy day as you can see by the palm tree in the background and there's this the smoke coming out of the funnel of the boat it was it was it was blowing in. so the clouds were moving really quickly and the light was flying i thought blimey if i run up to the top there and i might get lucky there might be a strip of light that catches the wicket i thought all i know is it's a roll of velvet here i can stick it i can do 500 7.1 that's full light push one stop and all you're doing and you run up there and, and you just shot these frames um and yeah you, you i saw you know saw pictures and thought oh that might be all right that might be all right so you come back down and you don't you, you don't think too much of it because it's on transparency. You're not processing transparency on site. We were processing a negative on site. So the films get put in a bag, sent back to London um, uh, for the for the dark room. It was all FedEx back. It was there was no urgency because all the all the all the key moments, if you like, had been shot on on film on C41. So we could process there and then and, and get it out for the for the Australian newspapers. Um, so I get one month, probably one month, five weeks later, we go back to the office. We come back after the tour. I think you know, everything was great. It was a lovely time, everything. And, and you walk into the office and said, oh, someone said, oh, there's your pile of trannies over there. You want to have a look? And they used to, the way a transparency is mounted, obviously in a plastic mount, and they used to have the red dot process on it. And you know, if it was a good, if it was a good picture, it'd have a red dot on it. Um, and I just heard someone say, oh, there's a quadruple red dotter in there. 
And I'm like, blimey, that, that must, whose is that? Is that Sean's? And they went, no, no, it's yours. I said, what is it? And I ran over and looked at it and I saw this on the light box to the loop. And I'm like, bloody hell, that's mine, you know? And and yeah. it, it just, the anticipation, but not knowing you had it and having to wait that amount of time to see it is something that obviously no, none of these, you know, none of you guys are going to experience that. But it was, it was back in the day, that, that was the way it was. And you, you had no idea what you were getting you had no idea about how the light really looked had i underexposed it did it look you know was the ship partially blocked was it cut in half by the, i had no idea i just remember seeing it through the viewfinder thinking it lasted seconds and luckily you know yes you know the batsman's playing a shot okay it's a forward defensive and in an ideal world you like a, you know a big pull or a hook or something to give it some shape but it, it is what it is and it, it was sort of one of my seminal moments if you like as a, as a youngster and it, it just basically yeah, you know, you basically suddenly it was blown up on a huge, as a huge copy on on the stairs at the old all sport office, and you walked up and it was on an illuminated light box about you know six foot across, and you were like, okay, that's that's my introductory, you know, yeah. ring, and hopefully there'll be more to come, you know. And it was one of those pictures that I am sort of, yeah, you know, obviously to the younger the younger guys possibly not known, but that is one of my sort of most renowned pictures, if you like. Mm -hmm. Stunning. And then on to the F1. So once once I'd sort of ended up, I, I did quite a lot of the cricket, um, to be honest, when I first started, because I discard, decided after that tour that I really quite like cricket. It took you to some nice places. You met some really nice people. Um, and it, they were a great bunch of people. We didn't do many more with the Australians. I did quite a lot with the England team or whatever. Um, but I then... I then decided in in about 1998, 99 that I, I didn't really want to travel that much because the, to be a cricket photographer is a dedication above and beyond. You're away an awful lot. And if you do all of it, you, you know, you really are. Cricket tours in those days were, were months and months. They weren't like they are now. You know, they weren't split yeah. up. It was, you know, you went away and that was it. Um, so anyway, I came back and said, I don't really want to do all that amount of cricket anymore. And, and it was kind of... It was put in front of me. It was kind of a little bit all or nothing, really. You need, you need to be in it or you're out. And I said, well, look, okay, I don't really want to do it. So luckily for me, we had a we had a contract within Formula One um, with a company called Shell, who obviously is a technical partner. Um, and they they basically wanted the same photographer because of the, the Ferrari sponsorship. They wanted the same photographer in the garage the whole time because they didn't want different faces. They wanted one name that they knew that was that, that was their photographer. The mechanics the team the bosses everyone would learn to trust you so i said yeah i'll do that i'll do that so that's basically how i started doing kind of if you like full-time f1 for for all sports stroke getty i'd done i'd got previous knowledge as you can see from this picture i think this was 91 someone will probably tell me um um which i shot for the local paper because living in northampton Silver, silverstone was our local circuit um so I used to go there so i had i had knowledge i'd shot formula one i knew what it was about and this was just one of those pictures that i shot for the paper so it was on black and white film and it was a bit of a bit of a key moment obviously i wish i'd had it on color but or in color but i don't um but it was it, it was just an opportunity handed to me and i thought okay i'll, I'll have a go at that and, and basically that's where it began so sort of 1999 michael cooper another legendary all sport guy who was doing the f1 with with mark thompson who's still doing it now and he he literally is the f1 stalwart he does every single race um covid permitting which he's missed a couple now for covid which i'm sure he's absolutely heartbroken about so <laughs> so mark i feel for you but he's he's done every race since god knows when um i i now have the the luxury of, of dipping in and dipping out which i'm incredibly grateful for because it means i don't have to commit my entire photographic career just to f1 because as much yeah. as i like it i like to do the other stuff too i like to go off and do my football world cups or i like to do my winter olympics or my summer olympics or whatever it might be or wimbledon's or french opens or just to, yeah. i like the variety i never set out to become an f1 photographer i set out to become a sports photographer um and like i say i wanted to be sean bottrell or clive brumsky or, or, or bob martin or any of those people you know yeah um and and that that is kind of what i've what I've fought to remain because it's it's very hard now. Your value is in specialization, really. As you notice now, a lot of the guys, particularly where we are at, at Getty, we, we specialize yeah. because your strength is yeah. in a specialist area because of your knowledge and your your contacts, if you like. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, back to contact, isn't it? Yeah. And if we go on to Monza, yeah, tell us about this one because this is quite so. Hard. It, it's the it's the old transparency film thing again. It was I, I'd been there. It was this was during qualifying, I think, on the Saturday, and I'd gone down to the second chicane at Monza. I was with Michael Cooper at, at this race, and. He sort of said, oh, yeah, go down there. The curbs are big. He said, you never know what might happen down there. So off I trot. And I stood down there and, you know, the cars come around. They, they make it around the bend. Everything's fine. And you, you're sort of pre-focused on the curb a little bit. Obviously, it, was, it wasn't really in the day of, of autofocus. So you pre-focus on the curbs. And if something jumped a bit, you kind of you pull focus a little bit just to kind of keep it, follow it a little bit. And of course, Giancarlo Fisichella came around. He, he basically has hit those curbs sideways. He's not going, when you're looking at a picture, he's not going... He's not coming towards me. He's actually going across me. So he's hit the curves and it's lifted him. Um, so it's probably helped the focus because he's not hurtling at me at a terrific rate. He's going across the frame. So my point of focus wasn't far out. So with a little tweak, it kept it kept it. The three or four frames were sharp. But um, so yet again, I, I came back. I didn't say anything because I didn't know I'd got it. So we went back to the press room and, you know, it was all this. And then we went through the race on the Sunday and then, the way we used to work was you'd fly back after the race on a Sunday night. You'd go straight to the office with all your transparency film. You, the guys would be there waiting in the dark room to dev it all for you. So you'd wait. You'd, you know, it'd be, what, two in the morning, three in the morning, and then you'd, you'd wait for the films to come off, and then it would be five in the morning, and you'd go through it, and you'd, it'd all come out. Then the guys would mount it for you, and you'd, you'd basically see what you'd got. And then I remember going off to get a coffee on the other side of the room and Michael Cooper shouting over to me, I won't tell you exactly what he said, but he said, get over it. Why didn't you tell me you got this? I said, what are you looking at? He went, fizzy airborne. And it just became fizzy, fizzy killer airborne. And it's just been, it, everyone just talks about it. Oh, a fizzy airborne. Oh, yeah, that's yours, isn't it? Yeah. And it, it's one of those moments, yet again, you don't know you've got it because it was on transparency. And yet yeah. again, the buzz the buzz of realising you you had got it was was kind of, was, was special. And, and we're missing that now a little bit. You don't get that buzz, but you get the buzz instantly when you see it on the back yeah. of the screen. So it, it's whilst we've lost the, 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 you know, the period of anticipation, you know, now it's a matter of seconds as opposed to days or weeks or months, yeah. you know, but um, it was just quite, it was just a, a nice, a nice moment and nice to know you got it really. Yeah. So you went on and you, as you mentioned, you've done the Olympics for many years, rugby, football, etc. but just, Going on to so what are the changes have you seen over the last few years? You've got a long career in photography. Things have changed. What's kind of been a benefit, or what's kind of been harder for you to deal with? I mean, I mean, everything changes, and generally speaking, um, access has become harder. So that's harder to deal with. Um, even at Formula One, you know, you, you don't get more angles; you get less angles. The more fences, more red zones. You can't go here. You can't go there. Um, the advances in equipment obviously have helped it not only helps you know you young guys whatever it, it helps us us older guys too if we can keep up with the technology which is becoming i'll be honest with you increasingly harder because you get these yeah. new and you look at and you think i really need somebody to tell me what to do now because it just yeah. is far too complicated sorry jackie <laughs> but, but, um you, you 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 know it, it's as long as you as long as you're prepared to, to balance what is now in 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 our world to get to images we're quite commercially driven so it, there's moments where your commercial brief if you like can can weigh quite heavily on you and it takes away from it's all very well thinking i'm going to go to this event now i'm going to go and i know where i want to take this picture i know where the sun's going to set i know that blah, 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 blah. i know where they're going to spark and it'll spark on this lap because he's got a full tank or whatever and you know you do all this and then suddenly a client says oh we've got a we've got a vip in the garage we need you there so you go right okay i've been waiting for this for like three months for this picture because i couldn't do it last year for whatever reason and this year. so you've got a You've got to roll with the punches, or you got to okay. Well, that's fine. You know, it, it is what it is. Um, so so it's the same as anyone at Getty. When you look at the portfolios that the guys produce, I'm not talking about me and the F1 or any of the F1. I'm talking about everybody, the golf guys, the football guys, everybody. They're all working under extreme pressure to to maintain client, you know, to, to corporate briefs, if you like. There there's so much we need to be doing. So the opportunity to be in the right place at the right time with the right light, with the right lens is is it's it's just increasingly difficult. So I, I just want people to understand that 
that when you see this stuff, you know, some people might think, oh, that's not a great portrait. But you know what? Given the circumstances, it probably is yeah. a great portrait. It's not a studio portrait, but it's it's the best you're going to get out of a situation where you're trying to shoot like an, an F1, a driver through through a completely moving target. And again, it's like shooting wildlife, but with like people in the way. It's like it, it's so hard to get. Yeah. Sometimes I think people look at like F1 portraiture and go on blind. When I say Porsche, I, mean, I basically I'm talking about pat grabbed headshots through yeah, exactly. through rope and stuff hanging down in garages and wires and tubes and mechanics. It's difficult, um, and you're doing all that whilst thinking to yourself, "Oh God, I need to make sure I'm back up there because I need to do the car coming out of the garage for a different sponsor." You know, so everything's a bit of a can be a bit of a compromise. So you've just got to kind of have your head screwed on and, and learn to work with within the constraints that you you know that you have really and because yeah. ultimately the most important thing is your client okay and yeah. if your client doesn't like what you're doing you're not going to that event again so so it doesn't matter how nice your picture might be of a sunset of this and that and that but if you've missed the big picture that they you know if they've got a, if they've got flipping daniel craig in the garage as you know whatever and you're not there to shoot yeah. it they don't they don't care if you've got a backlit silhouette with a sunset behind it they don't <laughs> they're like really <laughs> All we need is Daniel Craig with the drive. It's, it's okay, right? You get it. so. I mean, that's an extreme example, but, but it's reality. It's reality, and that's what that's what all sports photographers face. Not just Getty, you know, everybody. And and once you once you grasp that and put everything into perspective and realize it's all about the end result for the client, yeah. you know, and pleasing your editorial clients too, whether it's a newspaper or magazine or or whoever it might be, then. Then you'll 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 be fine, but don't ever lose sight of that. <laughs> so in two thousand and eight, they brought in night racing into Formula One. That had a big um, change in photography, didn't it? I mean, massively. It, it was it was yeah. for us. You, you used to get a situation where you probably had one opportunity of shooting a sunset every year. Um, it was probably at the end of the Barcelona test it, on, in a winter test in february march whenever it might be and, and if the cars ran late if there'd been a delay during the day and they ran a bit late then suddenly you'd get this you know the cars would come down into this this left-hand turn and sometimes they'd lock up and it'd be backlit and it'd be gold and it'd be lovely uh and everyone it was always oh god barcelona test we've got to be there for that that was it and then they did a few in in valencia um and they had you know it's a bit later again and it was you, you had those opportunities but they're few and far between night racing came along um, suddenly, they, there was you know you got your races that were starting at five in the evening, which was basically full light, and then they were going all the way through to, to you know an hour and a half later, so it was dark. So you got everything: you got full light, you got sunset, and you got darkness, floodlights, um, and then along came sparks. Don't ask me to explain why the sparks suddenly came back or what they do, because I'm like I said, I'm not I'm not an avid F1 fan or i'm not knowledgeable about the sport at all but it, it was suddenly like oh my god so suddenly we've got dark we've got floodlights we can do slow exposure slow shutter speeds and there's sparks it's like my god this this is incredible what you know this is just if everything you could possibly want as a, as a yeah. formula really because yeah. all the historic stuff you saw of all the cars sparking it was never yeah. at night it was always you know always in daylight or you, you'd wait for an overcast gloomy day and think oh great we can do some sparks now but yeah. when i started it was years and years and years and years cars just didn't spark and if a car sparked it was yeah. like oh, look at that something's gone wrong whereas yeah. now it, it you know i'm not going to say they're 10 a penny because certain cars spark and certain <laughs> some just don't because because of the setup but you, you it's it's increasingly more att attainable to get a sparking car now so yeah, yeah it changed a lot and photographically you know, the night racing opened up a lot of a lot of photographic potential for us and Obviously, you're quite renowned for your light trials, etc. But what strives you at each race or each event every time you do Wimbledon? What strives you to get better and better because you considerably do? I think, to, well, that's one, one that's really kind of you to say, and, and I, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm flattered you said I, I don't agree, but I, I feel I'm kind of going off a precipice at the moment. But there we go. But that's <laughs> that's, age, that's age and, and Christmas and, and everything else. Um, yeah. But I think you, you've You've got to just every time you go out you, it's got to be like the first time you go out the moment you go out and start thinking oh god here we go again you know and you you, you sometimes just got to, to get a bit of a grip we've we've all been there we've all walked up and down the paddock thinking why am i walking up and down here looking for a driver that doesn't really want to be photographed what am i doing with my life and then you take a grip and take a stop and go actually that's why i'm paid yeah i'm being paid to walk up and down here if i get a picture out of it great if i don't get a picture out of it yeah. 
then then so be it but you've got to try you've got to put yourself out there and it's the same with with, with being out on track you, you you can either go and replicate and do what you've done before if you found a picture you go I'll go and do that again which nothing wrong with that we all do it time and time and time again but you like to try and introduce something else as well and try and find something new um i th that can backfire massively i remember having a very good monaco in 2002 when i when i previously won sports tour for the year with the sja and I had a really good Monaco. And then so the next year, 2003, I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Monaco, but I'm not going to do any of the shots. I'm not going to go to any of the places I went to before. I'm going to go and try and find some new stuff. And you wander around and you wander around and you do this and you do that. And I came back and I looked at my stuff. I thought, you know what, it's really not very good. And and you, you've, got to be, you've got to be honest with yourself. You, you can't really, you can't, there's no hiding in what we do. Everyone's looking at what you do the whole time, particularly now with our, our website being open. You know, you, I can sit next to a photographer at a football match and that they can go back and instantly see what I shot, what I missed, what I didn't get, you know, and, and you, you've got to let that kind of wash over you a little bit because we all get stuff. We all miss stuff, you know, um, but I've lost my track, train of thought there. But, but yeah, so. Um, it's just what keeps you going. and Yeah, you, you've, you've got to just want it. You've got to want to find something new, you know, and I have tried the odd bit here and there, but, you know, sometimes people don't like the, the ultra creativity if you like i mean like yeah. you said about light trails you know i've been doing this this, this thing where you, you try and shoot at one second exposures and you the lights in the background move and you try and freeze the car within that frame as much as you can but doing it in a single right. frame and I, I work really hard at it and this is where you, you you get you become too close to what you're doing because yeah. i know how hard it is to capture but i can't expect you to know how hard it was for me to capture or yeah. or what the hit rate is or or, yeah. or anything else so i look at it and go i can't believe it. i'm i'm ecstatic that i've made that work that's a fantastic frame for me i'm really really happy um and then someone looks at it and goes well it's not pin sharp is it? and you go well it's it's unlikely to be pin sharp but yeah. one second exposure perfect. you know it, the, the the idea is the movement so if, if yeah. people don't get it you can't you can't make people get it yeah. um and I remember one I, I alluded earlier to a picture and it's tearing a picture up of mine. It was it was a classic. It was a um at the Chronicle Echo actually the the old it wasn't the picture it was the picture, it was the editor of the newspaper. They sent me off to do Chinese New Year celebrations and I'd done a picture of this dragon outside the local restaurant and I'd flash blurred it and it was all it was really I thought a really quite a nice picture. And he, he called me to his office and he had this picture in front of him. He, he said, what is this? I said, well, it's, it's, it's the Chinese New Year's. He said, it's a load of old, you know, and I'm like, right, okay. He said, I don't want that. He said, this is a newspaper. He said, we don't want that. I want to see, I want to see the owner. I want to see this. I want to see, I want to see fate. Want... And he literally ripped it up in front of me, threw it in a bin and said, then go out of the office and, you know, just, just don't do that again sort of scenario. And yet again, you know, for me, I, I was, I was, kind of I'm really heartbroken would be extreme but i was really really upset i'm like how can you not see that that's a nice picture it might not be exactly what you want for your local paper but it was a nice picture mm. and it didn't really deserve being ripped up in front of me but you know <laughs> horses for courses and, and and people either like it or they don't and you can't make yeah. people like what you shoot but as long as you're like i said as long as you're as long as you're happy with what you're doing but also yeah. your client or your or your employers are happy with what you're doing then there's a really, you know, there's a really fine balance there to make sure once you can't completely self-indulge yourself, um, yeah. but you've got to, you know, providing you can self-indulge yourself, providing you're doing the basics as well. Really. Brilliant. Okay. Well, that's all been really interesting. Let, let's move on to the winning portfolio and talk about how you pick the pictures. You've got a year's worth of fantastic pictures on your hard drive or whatever. How do you, how does that final cut actually happen? So a bit, a bit like Harry, you, you look at you look at primarily you'll know throughout the year that you've got a picture you like. And, I, you know, I'll have a folder on my desktop and I'll if, if I take a nice frame, I'll drop it into there. And, you know, depending on how good a year you've had, sometimes there can be 10 pictures in the end of the year. Sometimes there can be 50. Um, so you bung them in there. So it gives you somewhat somewhere to start. You, you need somewhere to start. You, you know, you're editing, but you can't sit down and look through your whole year's worth of work. Um, so I look at it and I, I, I look at um okay so in in the in the i don't know how in the senior senior category but not in the young sports world of the year we we get a folio of 10 so obviously it's much much easier to choose five is incredibly difficult um 
but it's it's leveled at five because obviously some of the the youngsters don't have the access to the events and you can't be expected to create more than five but if you were to try and restrict us to five because some of the comps are five i find it incredibly difficult even our getty internal competition is at eight and i find that really hard but 10 i think is a perfect number um and trouble is now now you've not letting harry enter the other junior one and then we've got him got it we've got to face up to this one now so there's someone else who's going to come in is going to probably sweep the board but but look i mean it's colors it's shapes it's um faces it's moments um and like you heard the the intro from the judges from last year you know you've got bob martin saying you need to show you you, you know you've got an eye for action you've got an eye for creativity you've got an eye for a portrait maybe you've got an eye for just general action <clears throat> and i think i was pleased to win this last year i'll be honest with you because i'd never won it when i won it before i won it with a motorsport portfolio um which was fine but it had a bit of rally in it bit of bit of moto gp bit of f1 <clears throat> this year because i predominantly do f1 i desperately wanted to win it with f1 my colleague mark thompson won it a couple of years before with f1 because he had a spectacular crash in there and a really nice set of pictures um and i think as nice as my set of pictures were until i got um until i got the lance stroll rolling upside down in front of me it, it was like i thought blimey that, that now is quite a strong set of pictures because you just need something you need a bit of you need a there's something that is solid action there's something that's a little bit unusual and yet again like harry said that, that dickie pelham had alluded to you need a banger you know and if there's a banger in there you put it up first and and it, it draws the eye and it gets the attention of the judges um i like to lay my stuff out in a, in a sort of sequence where i, I don't like I, I wouldn't have two red bulls side by side i wouldn't have two silhouettes side by side i wouldn't have two blue skies so I wouldn't have two sunsets I wouldn't have two orangey pictures so I, I lay them out and I choose I just choose what I think looks aesthetically pleasing and I think the way to look at it is the judges don't see it like that the judges don't look at what you're looking at now with that contact sheet they'll see it frame by frame so you know if that's I think I can't remember now maybe that was my first image it was either that or the rolling lance stroll I can't remember um <clears throat> but this is a classic example of you know um of just being in the right place at the right time but then executing it when it happens you know the going back to the the ray of light and the, the car in the pool of light there was from turkey which is a rescheduled race we shouldn't ever have been in turkey and they ran in turkey and it was in november so really late light europe um suddenly you've got clouds you've got rain and suddenly you, you got this little pool of light and 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 you know the the i, I can't remember the, the proper terminology for the rays of light coming down through the clouds there but it, it made a picture so suddenly you realize that has to go in as did that have to go in, which was the remains of the um, the horrific Grosjean crash, which I still can't quite believe you walked away from, and neither can anybody else, I'm sure. But but the funny thing there is about losing heart. It's very easy to to sort of miss a moment. I think at a race, if you, if you miss a moment, not necessarily at a race, at a football match, rugby match, whatever it might. If you miss a moment, it's very easy to let your head down and go, oh god, there's no point now. There's just no point. So bear in mind, my position for, for that race where Grosjean crashed was nowhere near where Grosjean crashed. I was um, somewhere else on track for my start, um, as I have been at that same position, at the same track. We tend to do the same start positions for some for some reason. It's just there's a little bit of you know comfort. You know what to do. You know where you are. You know how long it's going to take you to get there after you've done the grid or whatever you've done. Um, but Grosjean crashed. We didn't know he crashed because obviously it was behind closed doors. So you had no TV screen. So you knew it had been red flagged. And then suddenly we're like, blimey, OK, so what's going on there? Um, and then news got there's been a big crash. So we jumped in a in a golf buggy and went all the way around the track to get there to discover, obviously, Grosjean was actually out of the car at the time. And then the TV cameraman who was there, I knew, showed me on his screen what had happened. And you were like, oh, my God. I mean that that was like the biggest moment in in Formula One for a very 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 long time, yeah. And he said he he walked away, and we're like, Christ, okay, that that is, I mean, that is divine intervention if ever there was. So anyway, so that's happened at the start of the race, and you're like, right, okay, so really, there's not a lot. Of, even if they restart the race, what do we? And they did, they restarted the race, as any anyone will know. They they rebuilt those barriers. They got the car out. They lifted it all out of the way, and they rebuilt the barriers, cleaned it all up, and it was it started an hour and twenty minutes later, I think. Um, <clears throat> so then you, you can you can then go, oh, well, nothing else really matters. So you you go, well, I don't, doesn't matter where I go now because the story's happened. I haven't got it, you know, head down. 
So I went back to my start position. A couple of the other guys said, no, we're not bothering. We're just going to stay here and just it's not worth going back. So I made the effort to go back. Um, and at the restart, Lance Stroll rolled his force injury in front of me. So I was the only one there to get it. So it, it, it kind of, I guess the moral of the story is don't ever give up. Because, yes, on any other day, Lance Roll strolling his car would have been a nice picture um, and a newsworthy picture because it happened an hour and a half after the most horrific accident in Formula One in generations. It it didn't really have the gravitas. But when you look at it at the end of the year, it's still a really nice picture. Um, and it's just a good lesson, if you like. Just don't give up. Don't give up on an event just because you think you haven't got you haven't got the picture that matters. Excuse me, you might you might miss a try at a rugby match and think, oh God, what not now? And what happens if I miss the next one or whatever? And it's very easy to get disheartened, but you've just got to pick yourself up and go, no, you know what? Because you never ever know what's around the corner, you never know what's coming next. Just keep just keep alert and just keep going. And it's, it'd be very easy, particularly at my age, you know, just to go, oh right, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of hassle getting back to my start position. Yeah. Am I really gonna do that? But yes, I still do it, and I think that's what. You know, I'm not I'm not alone in that desire. There's a lot of people out there that have that desire, but then you you've got to be in it to win it. Um, and I, I enjoy the competition, so I will I will think throughout the year about what there is and what could possibly go into a set of ten at the end of the year. <clears throat> and I think the nice thing there with Lewis throwing his trophy in the air, I couldn't believe that he, he's looked straight up. Yeah. People, oh, yeah. The angle. yeah, I mean it, it's an unusual angle. Um, yeah. And then people say, oh, he's got a mask on, so it's not as good. And it's kind of like, well, actually, as far as the year goes, it actually tells a story because that that's it's timeless because you will know what year that was taken. You know, yeah. um, um, I was incredibly pleased to get it, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and good to be up in that position and take that position. But those those, those top positions can sometimes present nothing. Mm. Take a different angle. I think oh it might be worth a punt and you take a punt and it works out you know i've been up top many times doing those things and and nine times out of ten they don't make a picture you end up scratching around looking for some sort of champagne picture that you try and convince yourself works yeah. and it doesn't really <clears throat> but you're up there so you you pump it out and no one uses it and then it's you know it's all your all your beliefs to confirm because it doesn't really work but that did work um and it's worth a punt sometimes on a different angle well fantastic set so, Clive, having won about 12 SJA awards in the last 20 years, what advice would you give others on choosing their images? Like I just said, you, 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 know, you know what's good. Set your standards. Set your standards high. I think that the thing is you, you just need to stand by what you've shot. And if you if don't, don't get fooled and, and don't get led down the, the, the Instagram likes route because that doesn't necessarily mean too much because we can all look like a hero on Instagram as was said to me once. Um, and it, it's absolutely true. You know, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person. I put stuff on Instagram and there'll be pictures I've Instagrammed from last year that won't be in my end of year set because I know full well that Touchwood should I do all right in an award and should it be printed up and put on a wall somewhere, you've got to stand beside it and go and say, that's my picture. And if it if it doesn't hold up, if the quality is not there, it's not sharp. You're going to look like an idiot. So you, you just need to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff properly. Look at what you look at what you've shot. Just make a good job of what you're shooting in the first place, and yeah. and don't convince yourself that because you know you had X amount of likes on Instagram, it's it's going to do all right because it it may well do. And if it's a lovely, sharp, crisp, big big image, then then yeah, it will be. But sometimes they're not. And we're all we're all guilty. I'm guilty, you know, and I won't pretend otherwise. Um, but you've got to know where to draw that line, and you know, the social media line is sometimes a little bit blurred. Social media to reality it just needs to be a little bit more. Yeah, you need to be critical on yourself. Absolutely. Know that, you know, and and don't overwork stuff. Don't you know? There's an, an awful lot of editorial integrity um, scenarios that you'll come up against where you you realise you can't be changing colors you can't be blackening stuff that's you can't remove detail but is the essential yeah. the essential key you can't remove or add so yeah. the moment you make an area and it's difficult with digital now because there isn't a true black in digital there's always detail everywhere yeah which is what the camera camera manufacturers strive for which is contrary to what we used to shoot with transparency where on yeah. on velvia on fuji velvia blacks were black there weren't there was no detail so you had a proper black shadow and that that was lovely but yeah. with advancements in technology that that isn't the case anymore so just 
just be careful with 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 manipulation um because there are some very very strict rules out there and you know we all we all sail close to the wind i sail close to the wind sometimes and you have to look at it and go maybe i can't enter that one actually i've been pulled up before so well actually yeah. one why is that quite as contrasty as it is and you go well because i like it Do you want, it's a bit it's it's probably further than 20 percent from the original than it should be whatever that magic number is i don't really know what the magic number is but it, yeah. if you look at it and go oh blimey then you've probably taken it a bit too far and you need to kind of look at it if you can do it in camera, i think the rule is basically if you can do it in the camera then then fine but the moment you have to start messing with it in photoshop and whatever else and yeah. sticking raw files and manipulating it to within the nth of its life then you you're going to be in trouble brilliant and then just what did it feel like really winning the hat trick last year because that is quite unusual yeah i mean obviously delighted um and <clears throat> it's, it's it's lovely to to be at you know in my position if you like and i've had a very fortunate career i've been afforded all the available opportunities all the opportunities available to me have, have been immense and that's thanks to all my bosses you know or currently paul and, and adrian before that and whatever you know it doesn't happen without none of this happens without the, the backing of a, of a good company if you like and the ability mm -hmm. the assigning to let you go off and do this stuff um so I'm over, I'm over the moon, to be honest with you. I can't, I can't belittle it. A lot of people say about competitions that, oh yeah, they're subjective. Well, they are. And and the other thing I should add, it, it doesn't define you. We all want you to enter these competitions. We want to see the work of the young photographers. We yeah. want to see what, who's coming through. It's a good window into the into the industry. Everyone will be looking at it. You know, my my boss Paul Gillam is is there. He's part of the SJA panel. He he'll, he'll be seeing it. All the newspaper guys will be seeing it and names pop up you know and and someone will go blimey that's nice who's that and that name will get mentioned and yeah. and that's what's going to lead that's what's going to lead you on to potentially where, where you want to be it may not but obviously if you're not there if your name's not there you're not going to get seen <laughs> you're not going to get seen so you could take the opportunity to enter look at it you might not win but you know what you'll see all the stuff that has been entered and you know what you're up against i learned by looking at Back in my day, when I looked at the people I aspired to be, you had to buy magazines and you had to buy, you know, the Bob Thomas calendar or whatever it was to see these pictures because you just didn't, unless you knew where to look to find the, the work, you wouldn't, you would never see it. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's completely open. Everyone can see everything that everyone shoots and, and just do your research, look at stuff, learn from it. You can open pictures up. You can see the, you know, you can see the metadata, you can see how I shot whatever picture it is, you can see what ISO, what shutter speed, what time of day, you know. So it's it's all become everything's there now to help you become a better photographer. So use all that available information and just get out and do it. Um because yeah. it's it, yeah. That's I, great I advice, actually. Yeah. Well, thank you, Clive. A really inspiring chat. Can't wait to see this year's entry and from Harry as well. See, see how we go. And um yeah, thank you both for your time and back to James. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much, Jackie, uh, Harry and Clive. Um, on the sign up to uh, to this webinar and uh, and whilst you've been speaking, uh, we've had some questions in. Uh, we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Uh, so if your question isn't answered, then we will try and get uh, tr we'll try and get you an answer. Uh, you can I'll post my email address at the end, and you can get in contact with me, uh, and, and obviously we can get uh, we can get you an answer. Um, <clears throat> whether from Clive or Harry or, or somebody on the SJ committee or, uh, or, or things like that. Um, but one of the questions we've had, or probably sort of quite a common uh, question uh, that I want to pose to you guys is how do how do you advise that people stand out in such a competitive industry, whether it be sort of people looking to break into the industry or whether they're at a stage of their careers where they want to sort of take that next jump or whether they're sort of photographing amateur sports and they want to sort of get into uh, into professional or from lower league football or to, to Premier League? How do sort of people take that next step and, and sort of stand out and get those, sort of those opportunities? What are your sort of top bits of advice, really? Do you want to go? I mean, from my, from my point of view, obviously, I did it in a different generation to this. So, so Harry's probably Harry's route that he took is probably more relevant to to the people viewing this. It, it goes back, I think, to you, you've got to make the contacts, you've got to know the people, and you've got to just keep 
badgering people to a point you, you think, oh, it's going to be so annoyed and ringing him again. But, you, you know, the, that's the only way to stand out. We're all we're all at a level now. All the Everyone's got really good equipment. Everyone's got the knowledge. Everyone can go out and providing you've got a little bit of access to your sports. That's that's I guess is the, the problem is having access and getting passes. Um, it's not all about the big events. You know, you can make perfectly nice pictures by being at, you know, any minor event. It, it's so not about being at Liverpool or Spurs or, you know, or being at the Grand National or being whatever or being at an F1 race. You know, I get a lot of people ask me about Formula. How do I become a Formula 1 photographer? Well, you don't become a Formula 1 photographer. You become a photographer. Then you become a motorsport photographer. Then you learn the ropes as a motorsport photographer working for a smaller agency that just specialises in motorsport. That's how you get noticed. You don't get noticed by knocking on our door going, oh, excuse me, here's my pictures from Thruxton of the touring cars last week. Any chance? You know, that, that just doesn't, that's not a route. The route is to do things the proper way, to meet the right people on your way up, put yourself in the area you want to be in, and just, just bother people, really. You know, I get bothered a lot. Some people, you know, must think I'm really rude. I reply to as many people as I can. But sometimes you just can't. I haven't got an answer. There's no direct answer to that question apart from just meet the right people. And once you know those people, don't let go. Be like a rabid dog. Don't let it go. <laughs> shake us to death. <laughs> what do you reckon, Harry? What do you? Yeah, hundred percent. I'd probably be in your emails constantly. That's the <laughs> that's the level you got. You just got to constantly badger people and show people stuff and feedback. We went feedback keeps coming up but i think it's so important you don't you may think something's a good photo but until someone tells you that's that's good or that's crap or this is why this is good then you're never going to know so just constantly speaking to people and like dropping someone a message on instagram takes two seconds it might be scary but if they don't reply you'll you'll forget you sent it it just goes further and further down and you get over it like i've had so many people not reply to me I'm not going to call them out, but you just people. Oh, it was I one? <laughs> no, you weren't actually. Um, so you just just message people like, you, what's the Can worst? I take this moment to, to apologise to anyone who might be listening to this or I haven't replied to. So <laughs> do really, really, hundred percent try and reply to everybody. I, th I think you're right, especially with social media now. And I mean, uh, as you said, Harry, I mean, uh, you, you were you were on this webinar last year um, and reached out um, to a couple of the guys on the webinar about the uh, about your portfolio and putting that together. And 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 people res responded. I think in this in this day and age, uh, uh, people are people are sort of very generous with their with their with their time. So uh, uh, yes, a good 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 point there. Uh, next question we've had in. Um, can the artistic eye be worked on? Uh, is it talent, or is it uh, are you born are you born with it? It's definitely, definitely can be worked on. Um, talent comes into things, but it's all about what, yeah, working on things and experience and seeing something for the first time, and then thinking, well, right, well, if that happens again, I'll do this and I'll react differently. And tri trial and error, I think, is massive not being afraid to try something again or not being afraid to try something for the first time and if it doesn't work and most of the people who would be listening to this wouldn't have massive pressure on them like clive would to be in in the paddock at a certain time you can afford to go and try things and just work out what works and what doesn't it does, it's definitely not born with it i don't think no i'd, I'd agree 100 you, percent. you you learn by you learn by looking you learn by looking at other people's work and and you you might get an idea it might spawn an idea and you think oh i like the way he's done that but actually i don't want to copy it but i want to do it better and i want to look at it like if i do it like this and like i said now the artistic eye you know you, you're not born. i wasn't born with an artistic eye i just looked at a lot of pictures and worked out what i liked and what i didn't like and then you use you use the tools available to you and you you make the most of it and, and work out what is possible and what isn't possible um and then you get lucky, you get lucky with light, you know, but you put yourself in the right position, you work out where the light is. We've all seen the apps that show you where the sun's going to set and at what time and what's going to be the obstruction. Let's be honest, you know, we use every tool available to you. So, yes, there's an artistic element to, you know, to all of us that, that are doing this, but we're helped now a lot by, by technology too. So use it, use everything you can. Yeah, and homework's really important as well. Yeah. doing your research on something and listening to things and knowing what you're going to like 
moving to Ireland, I had to listen to so many podcasts and read newspapers and books and figure out what I was going to cover. And even rugby is a lot bigger here than it would have been in England. So I had to really just knuckle down and learn learn the rules even better, learn what I was looking at. Like the blood picture, I very easily could have missed a try because of that. But I just thought this is this is, could be a lot better than like because it was just a ruck and you know from experience that a try with a ruck is just the messiest thing and you can't really see anything and you send it because you've taken the picture of it but not it never gets used and no one ever comes looking for it because pe- more, more experienced people know that it just doesn't make a picture so you take you you ha- then have that experience and that knowledge you think well i can take a risk here and yeah so homework's very important agreed uh, next up is, have you ever felt the pressure when taking a picture, whether, whether that be to sort of get the right shot um, and how do, how, do you do, how do you deal with it and sort of move move past it? God, the, the day you don't feel pressure, okay, or anxiety or nerves is the day you're probably doing the wrong job because every single minute of this job is riddled with nerves and anxiety and pressure period for me i i get i get really really uptight and anxious and worry i worry at the start of every race i worry at <clears throat> the podium i worry at part ferme i worry at finish line pick i worry at everything and and the moment you stop worrying is the moment you probably become a bit complacent and you probably need to be thinking about doing something else so pressure is completely and utterly normal and I, I've been feeling pressure for my entire career, and it hasn't got any easier. If anything, it's got worse. So don't ever think it's going to get better, because it, in my experience, it doesn't. You've got to have confidence in your own ability and faith in your own ability, but you don't know. Honestly, pressure is there 100% of the time. Embrace it a little bit. Is that where you? Well, yeah, I, I've tried that as well. That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. What about, you, what about you, Harry? Yeah, it's really refreshing to hear Clive say that, to be honest. Right. reassuring that it's it's not just me and that it well hearing that it doesn't pass maybe isn't no, a good thing. I, I, but then I, you've also I, it, pressure also comes down to preparation as well knowing that you've done everything you've got you've got the right lens you've you've got everything in your camera bag you've got your memory cards in your camera bag you've got everything ready to go and then you still feel the pressure but then you feel prepared to handle the pressure mm. And I think and you said as well. You said it. We'll never good. forget, though. Can I just look, don't ever forget that we miss an awful lot of pictures. Okay, don't ever sit there and think, "Oh God, these guys, all their stuff's always amazing." You see the amazing stuff. You don't see that. You don't see the reams and reams of dribble and stuff that you've messed up, because there's a lot of it. You know, I, I, you can over, you can. Pre- preparation is a good thing, but you can over prepare. You can over anticipate. You can over analyze the situation. One very quick, I'll, I'll explain very quickly. Lewis Hamilton won his first world championship in Austin. We watched him win races. He curls up on the nose cone of his car and he prays. And he, so we're all stood there waiting for him, waiting for him. And I'm the 7200 thinking, right, I'm going to go in. I don't want to shoot this loose because he's going to go in. And he's he's going to then stand up and he's going to do this. And it's going to look great. And it's, and it's all, you got it. You'd seen it happen so many times. It's world championship moment. You think, right, I, I've, I've got this. I've got this. So he curled up and then he leapt and he sprang like a springbok off the front of his car straight towards us. And he's just leapt. And I've literally cut his head off as he's leapt because I'm on a 7200. The guy next to me who had no idea what was going on, he had a 2470 on a 24 and he was just shooting the whole thing loose and he went, Pfft. okay. So he had this epic picture of Lewis Hampton jumping off the car straight towards him. Whereas me and all the other motorsport guys who do it regularly, none of us got it because we all thought we knew what he was going to do. And it goes back years ago. People used to say to me, the late, great Mike King said it to me. Many people said, you know, the bigger the event, the shorter the lens. And it's something you you, you want to adhere to. But sometimes you think, no, I know better than that. I'm going to do it tight. I'm going to keep, I want it. When I get it, it's going to be epic. And then you screw it up. You know, and I, I, I think I remember Instagramming that picture to show people to say, look, this was my winning moment. This is my, you know, my biggest picture of the year. And I've picked it up. You know, it, it, it's but people need to understand that you don't get everything all the time and you can over you can overanalyze and, and think, you know, best. But generally speaking, you just don't really know. You just never know. So 
you know, that's the biggest picture I've missed in a very long time, but it won't be the last, I'm sure, you know. Like you say, I think I think it's important not to not to not to dwell on it, and that everybody makes uh, makes mistakes. Like like you said. There you go. Yeah. Uh, um, next up, we've got uh, the, obviously the press is dominated by football, rugby, cricket, uh, horse racing, F one. Are agencies interested in in less popular sports? And you touched on it. You touched on it earlier about um, about sort of specialising in one in, in one sport for people sort of at, right at the start of their of their career. Would you recommend just focusing on, on on sort of perfecting that the skill of photographing one sport, or to to get out there and and do as much as they can? Uh, and and have that variety what do you think harry i'll let you go first don't we? i think you should just shoot what interests you to be honest if it if you're just interested in one sport then just focus on one sport but if you like i really enjoy shooting a variety because it keeps me interested it keeps me fresh i don't know what i'm going to be doing week to week you kind of different things come up and and it's just each week is different um but going to the question, are agencies interested in less popular sports? I think agencies are interested in what they're paid to be interested in. If someone's going to pay for a, an equestrian picture, then they're going to be interested in it. And I think that there is enough interest in most sports that even if it's smaller and it doesn't make the back page of a newspaper, there's still there's still going to be interest there. Agreed. I mean, there's always, there's always been a thing with the agencies that they're, they're quite interested in taking... Um, offbeat stuff, offbeat features, things like that, things that we won't necessarily, as a, as, a, as a staff guy, go out and shoot because, one, we probably don't have time, we're too busy, preoccupied with doing the stuff that we do day to day, but there's lots of little things go on that, basically, if it's pretty <laughs> or or hard action, they're going to they're, they're look at it. You know, if it's flouncy and not really neither here nor there, then probably not. But, yeah, there's, there's room for... There's room in an agency for for imagery that just shows a creative eye and it's a bit different. You know, we've we've got at Getty, we've got a huge sales team. And if you came up with some random idea of some random sport and shot it in a way that hadn't been done before, then yes, they'd look at it. I'm not going to tell you 100 percent they're going to take it off you, but it might be like, oh wow, that's a good idea. You know, why why didn't why haven't we done that? You know, I did when I started out with I used to I love sailing and I can't sail and I know nothing about it, but I love taking pictures of it. Um but I used to go down to cows and I used to do all this transparency again. I used to come back and I used to go and knock on Bob Thomas's door and say, look, I've shot all this. Do you want to put it in your light? And he's like, oh, yeah, that's quite nice. So yet again, it's not mainstream, but it makes pretty pictures. And pretty pictures sell, you know, because they can use them for all kinds of random stuff. It's not going to make the back page of a newspaper, but it might make an advert somewhere and it might make whatever because they're non-professional boats. So they're not licensed. So there's no, you know, there's no commercial rights holders or anything it, it's just pretty pictures of sailing boats in the sun you know so there's, there's lots of little bits that you can do that that will get that an agency will pick up but you're right i mean there is there is definitely in this country particularly football is is the king um and everything else sort of follows down from that and that's it's our national sport so you, you've got to accept that so have an idea come up with something new and then present it and say look i've just shot this what do you think Excellent. Well, thank you very much, guys. I think we've reached the uh, the end of the uh, the end of the webinar now. Um, we're just under the uh, just at the sort of two hour mark. Uh, so I just wanted to say uh, sort of a massive thank you, really, to uh, to Clive and Harry and uh, Jackie for their time today. And hopefully, you guys have uh, have all found it interesting. Like I say, I, I say I know we haven't managed to answer everybody's questions. So uh, uh, for those that we haven't, then please do get in touch. Um, I'll flash my, my email address uh, is sjas2fevents.co.uk uh, so send me an email with any feedback or any questions or anything you uh, you want answering that we didn't cover uh, and we'll get back to you um, the only thing that's left is uh, to sort of draw out the winners of the uh, of the 2.8 magazine Olympic edition uh, we selected these at random and they are John Bradley and Morgan Harlow so if you can get in touch with me um, via sj at s2fevents.co.uk uh, that would be much appreciated and again like I'll just leave you with a message of, uh, of just a big thank you again to uh, to Jackie Harry and Clive uh, and thank you very much, guys.